We are talking today with Francis Moore LePay. Francis Moore LePay in 1975, along with Joseph Collins, launched the California based Institute for Food and Development Policy also known as Food First, described by the New York Times as one of the nation's most respected food think tanks. In 1990, she co-founded the Center for Living Democracy, a 10-year initiative to help accelerate the spread of democratic innovations. She has received 17 honorary doctorates from distinguished institutions. In 1987, in Sweden, she became the fourth American to receive the Right Livelihood Award, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel, for her vision and work healing our planet and uplifting humanity. She is the author of numerous books, including the 1971 three million copy bestseller, Diet for a Small Planet, her other books include Democracy's Edge, Choosing to Save Our Country by Bringing Democracy to Life, Hope's Edge, The Next Diet for a Small Planet, You Have the Power, Choosing Courage in a Culture of Fear, and she is here to talk about her latest book, Getting a Grip, Clarity, Creativity, and Courage in a World Gone Mad. If you would begin, tell us what was the motivation in writing your book, Getting a Grip? Well, it was either write a book or stand on the rooftops and start shouting it out because I feel like people are ready to, you know, just sort of stop random acts of sanity is the way I think of it and just really stop kind of grasping at straws, let go of that, and to really dig to the roots. And what I mean by getting a grip is I mean, okay, folks, let's really dig together to figure out what is the root of the problem that is pulling us down as a planet, not just as our culture. I think we have to be in that conversation together. And I'm not claiming that my book is the answer for all of us, but I'm hoping that it can be a key in that conversation I want to have with people. Just what is the root cause? Because as I often think to myself, no one gets up in the morning, any society, and says, yes, 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 I want to or another child dies of hunger today, or, yeah, I'm going to set my alarm so I can get up and heat the planet and kill species and flood the coastal areas. I mean, no one, no one does that. So why are we creating a world that we as individuals abhor? We've got to figure out the answer to that question. So one of the things you talk about in your book is, is frames, mm -hmm. how people look at things. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I've come to the conclusion that there's only one thing powerful enough to have us creating a world that violates us. You know, There's only one thing powerful enough to have us creating a world that violates our common sense and our deepest hardwired sensibilities, and that is the power of ideas or the power of frame that we human beings are distinctively creatures of the mind, that we create our world according to the ideas that we hold, moment to moment. And unfortunately, my, my thesis is that unfortunately, we are alive this critical moment when the planet is on the ropes, when the dominant frames, the dominant ways of seeing our life threatening, our life destroying. And so we've got to do what some may have thought would be impossible, but I don't believe it is. We have to surface. We have to become conscious of the limiting frames and to remake them. And that's what I, that's what I want to be part of, and I think it's happening. So I'm hoping you can jump in with examples, because you always um, have these great Absolutely. examples. That are Absolutely. Well, I mean, let me just say that what I mean by that, I mean, all this sounds very general. Uh, we have to change the frame, yes. I'm saying that our ideas about democracy, our ideas about power, and ideas about fear in particular, and that's what I take up in getting a grip, are fundamentally tying our hands so that on the good... Putting it in the, in the positive frame, people are letting go of the dangerous idea that democracy is simply elections plus a one-rule market economy, that one rule being highest return to existing wealth that concentrates power, which is the anathema of democracy. So people are shedding this dangerous frame that democracy is just this thin duo of elections plus a market economy driven by one rule. And they are actually giving birth to, in their lives, in their communities, democracy as a way of life, what I call living democracy. And I see this is not some new ism, not some new manifesto. In fact, I was horrified when Publishers Weekly referred to my new book as a manifesto. And I thought, oh, gosh, I thought I was writing an anti-manifesto. But again, I think it's the frame. They don't have a frame for an anti-manifesto. So um, what I'm suggesting is that 
uh, we don't need a new ism. We need a new sense of ourselves, a new sense of our own power to be in this conversation of democracy, to be co-creators. And so what I see people doing is letting go of this notion of democracy as something done to us or for us and think of democracy as a way of life that not a set system, but a set of system values that permeates every aspect of our public and our private lives too. So that I tell in getting a grip about Say, take the sector of education. What does living democracy look like showing up in education? It looks like a school in rural Ohio, very, very poor school, where 10 years ago, 20% of the kids were going to college. And then a new principal came in who believed that you learn democracy by doing democracy. And gradually, he transferred more and more decision-making over to the high school students, gradually to the point that they have equal say with their teachers as to what new faculty are hired. And as a result of living democracy, they now uh, graduate uh, going on to college, um, 70% of their students going on to college. It is a very different world there as students learn the power that is theirs. So part of democracy that is emerging is rethinking power. It's not something that somebody else has, something something to us, done to us, not something that we divide up, you know, if you have more, I have less, but actually what we ourselves create. So I could go you know, sector by sector, but um, education, economics, we think, oh, Thomas Friedman tells us that it's all sewn up. Corporate globalization is the end of history. And actually, if you look beneath the veneer of books like his and, um, you know, uh, major media reports on the economy, you realize that, no, 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 it's not at all sewn up. In fact, 58% of the U.S. economy is still place-based. It is independent uh, enterprise and uh, uh, social benefit organizations, or what some call uh, nonprofit. I don't like that term. Um, and uh, local government and state government. In other words, it's not big corporate control. So there, it's it's. And the other thing in economic life is that we are showing more and more and more, we people, that what can work um, is not simply the highest return to existing wealth model of ownership by the distant shareholder, but in fact, um, producer cooperatives, democratic organization, today in the world, more people are members of cooperatives than own shares in publicly traded companies. And uh, there are some of the most successful parts of the world in terms of uh, real economic development are those that uh, have a good portion of their economy that has been created by producer and other kinds of cooperatives, such as the northern region of Italy around Bologna. It's one of the wealthiest parts of Europe. And uh, 30, 40 percent of the GDP is created by cooperatives. So I, I try to suggest that, in fact, it's not all over. We are in a moment where there's tremendous generation of, of um, people waking up to the failure of a system that basically disempowers us. So it sounds like a lot of these examples, too, are happening uh, in other countries overseas. Do you see just as many um, examples like the example in Italy and the cooperatives uh, taking root here in the U.S.? Well, <clears throat> I know now today that there are more, I was told by the food co-op movement that there are more food co-ops being created now than there were in the 1970s when Joe and I founded Food First. Um, and there's a change now where, as in northern Italy, in the Emilia-Romagna area, it's not just one independent, struggling co-op trying to get started, but they are networking with one another and supporting one another. I know in Oregon, uh, the Medford, the new co-op starting there, was helped by the Ashland uh, Food Co-op. And so there are, this is reminiscent to me of the Emilia-Romagna example where they tax themselves something like two or so percent of their producer co-ops and they put that, they pool that money to help all of them in their research, in their marketing, in their financing. Uh, so I, I see that. And then I love to tell stories on myself in a sense of, of little faith stories, um, meeting in the late 80s with a few, a handful of um, 
dairy, angry dairy farmers in Wisconsin who were watching their friends go out of business and even committing suicide. The 80s were a terrible, terrible decade for the American farmer. And so they decided to c create a producer cooperative to retain the, um, the profits instead of having them go to corporate headquarters somewhere else. And I listened to their plan and thought it was very sweet. Uh, I say that, my, you know, with tongue in cheek in the sense that I think back on that as they told me what they were going to do. And I thought, well, this is really good. It could probably help some people in western Wisconsin to stay in business. And I'm so, you know, impressed with these guys. Well, little did I know that less than 20 years later that I am now, you know, buying their products in Boston because this is now the Organic Valley Producer Cooperative uh, that is nationwide, $300 million operation, a thousand farmers across the country, and still democratically run. And and I often think to myself, wow, if those guys had had the lack of confidence that I had, um, where would we be? And so I, I think of the people like George Seaman and the others who started the Organic Valley Producer Cooperative that is now so successful and so still run by its democratic principles, and I think that is power. Now, what if they, what if George and his friends had just said, oh, you know, we're finished, we'll go into Madison and get a job, we're done, this is too much, or if one of them had committed suicide. So what they did is exactly what I'm talking about in my book. It's learning to rethink power, not as something that just somebody else has, but trust the power of our own commitment, our own knowledge, our own creativity, our own, you know, just absolute persistence and refusal to give up, and, and of course, the vision uh, entailed in that undertaking. So um, to me, it also has to do, and I go on, and the, the last part of the book is about courage, and I redefine fear as, uh, you know, I redefine hopefully our relationship with it, because I think of what those fellows must have experienced when they started, that without any certainty that they could succeed, and certainly not at the level they are now, a $300 million operation, and yet they took the leap. So, you know, it's it's uh, rethinking that uh, I'm sure they, they had fear as they went forward. Uh, and they didn't, that didn't mean to them that they were doing the wrong thing. It might have meant that they were doing exactly the right thing. Talk a bit more about power. It seems it's, again, one of the things that we are, uh, at least in Western society and, and here in the U.S., we are taught that, you know, we as individuals don't really have much power, that power resides in large institutions like the government and or corporations. What's the truth to that? Well, it certainly is self-fulfilling, and uh, I just underscore that I believe this question of power is at the root of it all, that what is bringing us down is that we've accepted a, a cultural norm that actually makes people feel absolutely powerless, and I think that this is why depression is an epidemic in this country and, and globally, uh, because human beings innately need to feel that their lives have meaning, that what they do makes a difference, not just putting bread on their table, but in a larger sense. I strongly believe that. And so what uh, I see, what, what gets me going in the morning is learning from the, you know, the organic valleys of the world, but across, across all dimensions of American public life. And a key piece of this has to do with our political decision-making, choosing our leaders. And I think so many Americans have, unfortunately, um, and I want to change this, have given up on removing the power of money from our political system. And uh, many have just said, absolutely, Greg Pallast was right in the title of his book, We Have the Best Democracy Money Can Buy, and they, you know, that's the end of the story. They don't, they say that, of course, without even knowing that 61 uh, lobbyists are walking the halls of, in Washington for every person that you and I elect to represent us there. So the citizenry of America is now outnumbered 61 to 1, the private interest versus the common interest. And what they also do not know is that there is a solution. Because through the years of campaign finance reform, Americans have kind of folded their arms and said, well, every campaign finance reform has ended up with such loopholes in it that here we're going to about to have the first billion dollar presidential election in 2008. What I want to tell the world about and what I'm so excited here in Washington with your organization 
uh, for clean elections is now we have 10 years of success at the state level in two states, two very different states, Arizona and Maine, about to begin in a third very different state, which is Connecticut in 2008. Uh, We have a record of voluntary public financing, and it works. In Maine, 80% of the people elected to the state legislature have run clean. That means that they are not answerable to anyone but the citizens of Maine. They did not take corporate money. They did not take big private donations. They are accountable to the citizens. So... You can go on our website, uh, gettingagrip.org, and meet my new superhero who will embody for you this message because you can meet Deb Simpson, who was a waitress and a single mom with a high school education in the year 2000. Her friends saw a lot of leadership in her, a lot of leadership potential. So they said, Deb, you should run for office. And she laughed and she said, what are you talking about? I don't have a name. I don't have money. They said, no, but we have clean elections in Maine. And all you have to do, Deb, is get five bucks from 50 people, and you can get public money to run. And she said, oh, I'm a waitress. I think I can do that. (laughs) And she did. She ran for office. She then went to college, and she is now co-chair of the Judiciary Committee for the House in the state of Maine. So what can happen? It's not only that clean elections, that is voluntary public financing. You know, I'd always focused on on the fact that voluntary public financing means that those elected, after they're elected, they're not accountable to, you know, large corporations, that they don't feel that pull to to respond to the favors that have been given to them. But the other piece that we so desperately need is that voluntary public financing or clean elections opens the door to a whole range of leadership that would would not have a chance to shine like people like Deb. And so the group here in Washington, I I love the name, it's just Wash Clean, (laughs) washclean.org. And um, uh, representatives from Wash Clean were at my um, talk at Elliott Bay Bookstore, and so I got to meet them in person. And it's just such a delight to feel like um, I'm, you know, we're pulling together on this one because I'm amazed at how many audiences I speak to, often very progressive people who have never heard about the impact of voluntary public financing and do not know that it has succeeded in two states and is about to begin in Connecticut. Talk about the uh, overcoming the power of large corporations and the idea that the large corporations pretty much control our media that then, of course, controls the flow of information that to the people who need to receive this message. Yes, the control of the media, the control of corporations in our in our economy and in our society can, can absolutely feel overwhelming. But I also know, and I'm sure you would agree, that there's great deal of suspicion of major corporations that 90% of us agree across all political spec that they have too much power in Washington. There's a great deal of suspicion. And so that I think this opens a door, as you know here, you know, with uh, community radio and public radio and all sorts of opportunities on the web and and now with podcasting and YouTube and Quantum Shift, which is another wonderful Quantum Shift TV, which is a kind of progressive um, uh, alternative to YouTube. It's a it's a wonder we we have uh, our our. Um, video uh, posted both on Quantum Shift TV and on YouTube. So there are so many opportunities for us now to do that, what I think of as more democratic horizontal communication and real conversation with one another. And so that I, I think that there are ways then to under, to get the idea out there that we don't have to just give up in front of corporate power. That, for example, I believe in part because Maine has voluntary public financing, that it was able to do what you in Washington have done here. I don't know much about the law, but I know you have you have it here, and I know a little bit more about it in Maine. It's called producer responsibility legislation, where corporations in Maine. Um, 
because of laws passed there about two years ago, they are required, producers of electronic equipment are reti required to take responsibility for the entire life cycle of their products. And this was initiated by an environmental organization in Maine that was so profoundly alarmed by the incineration of uh, computer equipment that um, put toxic pollutants of you know, these really chemicals that are in these uh, computer into the air. And then they saw a film about how their equipment was being dismantled in China uh, by people with no protection against these deadly chemicals. And so they took it upon themselves to organize a campaign for this that is very now very established in Europe where corporations have to be responsible for the life cycle of what they produce. And there was a tremendous resistance from electronic corporations you know, Panasonic and, and you know, Apple and on and on. There's only one company that actually supported the bill, and that was Hewlett-Packard because it, it has a recycling plant. So they saw that as a good thing for them. And yet it passed, even though there was such resistance by the corporations. And I'm convinced that it passed in part, at least, because of clean elections in Maine. So that we can, as I put it in, in getting a grip, I think about... Uh, re-embedding economic life in democracy. I think of putting values boundaries around it. Of course, the market is a very useful means of exchanging goods and services. And we don't want to do away with the market, but we want it to serve us. And so what a producer responsibility law does is it, it gives a framework, a values framework within which the market works. And you know, another uh, consequence of requiring corporations to take responsibility for a life cycle of their products, then and they start looking at the manufacturing differently, and they start creating products that are easier to recycle and with less toxic materials in them because they know they're going to have to deal with them. So it sends back through the through the loop. It sends back very constructive messages, and and that's really what we're talking about. Um, that. Uh, people as they see other countries, and part of what I'm doing is, yes, talking about what's happening here, but also pointing out what's happening elsewhere that we can be doing, because a capitalist country like Germany, for example, it has what... Um, well, they have a weird name for it that doesn't make sense in English, but I call it rewarding renewables, basically a legislation in Germany that requires uh, the uh, utility corporations to buy energy from anything from a household that puts a solar panel up to uh, a small company that's producing geothermal. It requires utilities to buy that energy at a price that will make it profitable for even the householder over a period of time so that they can get their investment back, not in 30 years or 20 years, but in a few years. And within, oh, maybe six years of that legislation, Germany now has about 12 percent of, of its electricity coming from renewables. This is not rocket science, folks. This is not, you know, some brilliant uh, solution. This is just common sense. Reward renewables. And we can do that here, too. So talk a bit more about overcoming uh, fear. Again, that's another thing that appears that our society ingrains into us, the fear of the unknown, the fear of being powerless. Fear, yes, we're drenched in it. And uh, I love to quote a French philosopher I, I heard speak of the World Social Forum in Brazil. He said, he started his speech, fear is the emotional plague of our planet. And at that time, I was writing my book about fear called You Have the Power. Now, I didn't put fear in the main title because publishers said Americans were too afraid to write, read a book about fear. <laughs> So I snuck it into the subtitle, but <clears throat> here, here I, I wrote about fear because I've experienced a great deal of it. I did during that period, and I got really close up and familiar with it for maybe three or four years in my life. And what I learned by that deep experience when you know I really went through the dark night of the soul personally, and I had some wonderful opportunities to learn just serendipitously from great teachers about fear. And it caused me to have this realization that, yes, we evolved over 95% of our evolutionary history in tight-knit, deeply you know, interconnected tribes in which we grew to know two things about fear. 
One is that the sensations, the body sensations of fear, we learned were pretty reliable. You know, when we saw that lion out there, we knew that that feeling, the heart beating and the hair on end, that, you know, that was a pretty good signal that we'd better either throw that spear, get out of there, or freeze, you know. And so we we trusted those symptoms, if you will. And we also knew in our tribal, our tightly knit, tribes that being expelled was virtual death sentence. And so we evolved knowing two things. One, that we could trust our fear sensations in our bodies, and that separating from the pack was really dangerous. So then I think, okay, but right now, in the 21st century, the hyper-tribe, I believe, is metaphorically speaking, heading over Victoria Falls, right? We are, the hyper-tribe is headed toward disaster. We are experiencing disaster. So separating from the pack takes on a whole new meaning. It doesn't mean death. It means life. But we're still hardwired to have that pounding heart or, you know, that cold sweat. And so we have to give it entirely new meaning today. And what I mean by that, again, goes back to the reframe, to the rethink, to the new idea about fear. And I have a really homey example I want to give you that works for me and maybe some of our listeners. And that is that I was in the premiere of Inconvenient Truth in Boston. And as the lights went up, Al Gore himself walked down the, walks down the aisle, and I could almost feel a collective bow about to happen. People were so enamored and so impressed. And while I was pleased that he had produced this and am pleased with the effect of it, I was also very upset with Al Gore because I felt that he pulled his punches, and I didn't understand why. That he, Why didn't he take it all the way home and say, folks, we've got to get our democracy back. We've got to get money out of the system. We are subsidizing fossil fuel industries. Um, the first step is to get that money away from them, and to do that, we've got to reclaim our democracy and have clean elections. Elections. Instead, he mainly talks about things like changing light bulbs. So, as soon as I realized that I was out of sync with all my friends around me, my heart started going crazy and it started beating out of my chest because I knew I wanted to say something, but I was afraid. And at that point, I usually, when that happens to me, I, the messages are like, okay, you wimp. That's what I'm thinking to myself, you wimp. But instead, I thought, ah, oh, inner applause. I renamed this pounding heart inner applause. And by that, I mean that I, I rethought it as, okay, you are right where you should be. And the fact that your heart is pounding, it's just information. It's just energy. And when you get up to speak, your voice is going to crack. But you know what that's going to say to people? It's saying to people that you are really doing something that's uncomfortable. And in their deepest psyches, they're going to know that that's more brave than getting up to say something casual. And so I got my hand up. Now, Al Gore did not call on me that night, but it still was, for me, a turning point where I, I took this message that I'd been telling others about taking that fear energy and renaming it, rethinking it, and using it to go. That, In other words, thinking of those feelings of fear as meaning that it's a verdict, that we're doing the wrong thing, you know, that we're in the wrong place, wrong time, and we should go with the crowd, that that may mean that we are just at our growth point and that we are doing exactly what we need to do for our own mental health and our own growth and what the planet most needs of us. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time. What final thoughts would you like to leave with listeners? I think that often um, we think about... Uh, what we are going to do with our lives in terms of, um, oh, I don't know, what, you know, some endpoint uh, that, that we think that we are targeting. And I guess what my book, Getting a Grip, suggests is that we keep in mind that the most central issue right now, the one that is the issue behind the issue behind the issue, is this feeling of powerlessness itself. 
And so whatever it is that grabs our curiosity, and that's what we have to start with. And that's where my life began when I realized how curious I was about why hunger in a world of plenty. And that has kept me going all these almost 40 years now, that we grab hold of our curiosity, let it lead us, but always with the question in mind, how does what I'm doing enable people to realize the power that is theirs? Because the problem behind the problem is our feeling of powerlessness. So it's not enough for us to have the right answers or to proclaim the right answers or to have our manifesto of the right answers. If we are not behaving in a way and suggesting ways in which people can gain the sense of power themselves, walk with their fear, and to share our own feelings of fear so that others will feel it's okay to be afraid and still keep going, then I don't think we're going to build this and we're, we can't turn this this beautiful planet toward health. So I just want to put out there that let's together begin this conversation about how we create more power, how not just we divide it up, but how we generate it, how we rethink it and generate it. And that is the conversation of democracy. So again, it's not enough to just have our solutions. It's not enough, you know, to to proclaim the right answers. Certainly it's not enough to target, oh, George Bush is the problem or Dick Cheney is the problem. Uh, Rather, we have to dig this deep to understand what are the root causes. And again, I think the root causes have to do with our own feeling of powerlessness. And that we have to constantly be asking why. And then to experience power ourselves by walking with our fear uh, to do that which we believe is the most important thing that really pulls our curiosity, that really pulls our passion. We've just been talking with Frances Moore LePay. She is author of the new book, Getting a Grip, Clarity, Creativity, and Courage in a World Gone Mad. And you can, again, reach her via her website, smallplanetinstitute.org.